Okay. Hello, good afternoon from Luxembourg, uh, and welcome to the sixth webinar of uh, EU Datatone 2020, the Open Data Competition. Um, I'm going to introduce myself first. Uh, my name is uh, Immaculada Farfán Velasco, and I'm working in the Publications Office of the European Union, more concretely in the EU Open Data Portal, the single point of access to uh, the open data from the EU institutions, agencies, and bodies. So what I'm going to introduce you to this webinar. So this webinar presentation will consist in four uh, different um, institutions or speakers. So the first one is going to be uh, EMOTNET, that is the Open uh, Marine Data Initiative funded by the Directorate uh, General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. And they're going to present for Challenge 1, European Green Deal. Then we're going to have the European Union Intellectual Property Office presenting for Challenge uh, 1 as well for the European Green Deal. And then we have uh, the European Asylum Support Office for Challenge 3, a new push for the European democracy. And then we will finish with the European Commission, the Joint Research Center for Challenge 1, 2 and 4. So um, I'm going to introduce you very briefly uh, what you need to know about this competition before I start. So, this competition uh, brings innovative ideas uh, for Europe with EU Open Data. It's the fourth edition of this competition, and um, anyone can participate. It's a worldwide competition. And um, what is in for me? Why should I apply if I'm interested? So there are several um, benefits out of it. So first of one, first of first of all, like you will have. The opportunity, the opportunity to show your creativity and talent, demonstrating the potential of open data. It will also help Europe achieve important goals set by the European Commission, that is set by the different challenges, the four challenges we have, that they're aligned with the new Commission. And then you can claim your share of the total price fund amounting to 100,000 euros. That is also very interesting. So then now that I cut maybe a little bit your attention, if you are in, you're interested in participating in the competition, how can you participate? So then uh, you need uh, to be in teams up to four people and you can choose different challenges or apply to all of them. But it's important that it's one proposal per challenge in team. So then, as I was saying before, uh, the idea is to uh, follow uh, the, um, the political priorities of the European Commission and help Europe, Europe in the future. So then uh, you have to apply for uh, any or all of these challenges, as you can see here. We launched this competition already uh, the 19th of February. So now uh, we're waiting for you to work on your proposals and your ideas. And you have until the 3rd of May to uh, submit your ideas. So then it's very important you don't miss the deadline. You uh, organize it with your teams and you come up with uh, the ideas of the applications you want to develop. So then what happens if I'm shortlisted? If we like your idea, if you are shortlisted, you will be invited to develop your proposal. So you will be invited to present, to develop it within certain months, and you will have the opportunity to present your application on the 18th European Week of Regions and Cities in Brussels. So this organization gathers, uh, this, uh, this event gathers more than 9,000 people every year. And uh, you will have your stand on the 13th and 14th, where you will have the opportunity to network, to show your application, your results of your work within these months. And then you will participate in the final, competi final competition on the 15th. So where we will have like the final selection. So what are the prices? So in this day, the final ranking of the winning team for each challenge will be decided at this event. And the teams will be awarded with the following prices, price per challenge. So for the first place is 12,000 euros, for the second place is 8,000 euros, and the third place is 5,000 euros. So then, as I was saying before, it was very important to submit your proposal, and you don't miss the deadline, and you participate in this amazing opportunity to develop ideas for Europe. So please don't submit your deadline before the 3rd of May. So then. What is the purpose of this webinar? So, since there are certain uh, rules that you have to check, in, you can check directly in our website. This webinar is organized to help participants to better understand the data they have to use 
uh, where to find this information and how to get the best out of it. So the different partners we have, they are participating the speakers in order to help participants to know uh, how they can exploit this open data and its potential. So then, if you want to have more information, of course, you can uh, contact us directly to a functional mailbox and we will answer to your questions. Follow us on Twitter in order to know what's going on and not missing any um, information. And don't forget to say the hashtag. So now uh, I'm going to finish here. And then I will give the floor to my colleagues from uh, Ebonnet. So then it's your turn. You can share your screen, Timo. Tim, thank you. Hello, can you see my screen? Just to confirm. Are you, are you able to see the screen? Thank you. Um, so um, I will give, be giving you an introduction to what eMotNet, the European Marine Observation and Data Network has to offer. Um, so uh, we um, have proposed to offer data for the, the first challenge, the European Green Deal. And this is because uh, many of the challenges set out within the, the, the Green Deal are intrinsically linked to the ocean and the marine environment. Um, and this is why we like to call it the Green Blue Deal. Um, to give you a few examples, um, increasing EU's climate ambition. Um, the climate um, is very much linked to the ocean. It's absorbing a lot of CO2 um, and uh, one of the, the main important effects of climate change is sea level rise. Um, clean and affordable energy, um, a very important domain within renewable energy are offshore wind farms. Um, mobilizing industry for a clean and circular economy. Um, the, the the blue economy or the, the maritime economy is a very important one, which is projected to grow a lot in the coming decades. Um, and therefore, it's very important that also in this section of the economy, uh, the marine sec the maritime section, um, we, uh, we make sure that it's a clean and circular economy. Then zero pollution uh, ambition for a toxic free environment. A very important problem to tackle here is the problem of marine litter. Um, as I'm sure all of you have heard of, um, then preserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity. Uh, the marine environment is a very important part of our, of our, of the biodiversity and ecosystems on our planet. Um, and then from farm to fork, uh, a fair and healthy environmental and friendly food system. It's very important that of course we include the fisheries and aquaculture sector there. And finally, mobility. The oceans is still one of the main ways we distribute books and, and people around the globe. And therefore, um, also here, the ocean is very important. So why do marine data matter? Um, here, I'd like to quote Carmenu Vela, uh, the previous um, commissioner for the environment and for maritime affairs and fisheries. So sound ocean data is indispensable if you want to tackle major global issues such as climate change, marine litter, illegal fishing or marine protection. It's also a bare necessity if we want to develop the blue economy and create sustainable economic growth in the EU. So um, it's not just data we need to offer, but we need to be able to unlock the knowledge within this data and drive innovation. So well, what, I've, what I've put on this slide is basically the marine value chain, as we call it, where you go from observations to data collectors like eMotNet and some of our partners, CDataNet and Copernicus uh, for, for satellite data. And from this data, we need to derive information, knowledge, and eventually develop applications and innovation. And this is where, where you within the competition come in, um, together with, with other players like industry, research, um, and, and policy making, of course. But it's also very important that uh, there is a feedback loop going from the people uh, implementing the, the, the applications and the innovations back to the marine observation and the data networks so that we can make sure that you have everything available. So um, just to give you a short update on, on what eMotNet is, so it's a long-term European marine knowledge initiative funded by um, 
the European Commission, DG Mare. Um, so it's a marine knowledge broker uh, which collects data on the ocean and offers it open and free of access. Um, it exists of a very large network of more than 150 organizations of experts and data contributors. Um, and uh, it, it, it makes sure that it's complementary and it's aligned to other open data services. For example, the Copernicus Marine Service, they will offer um, satellite data while we offer observations within the marine domain, like in situ observations and data. Um, and really, we offer data and products from the surface all the way to the seafloor. And we do this within seven thematic domains, as you can see on the image here. Um, but I'll, I'll get back to that in a later slide. Um, and, and then we also have a few centralized services. Um, as I told you before, this feedback loop between um, innovators and industry with the data collection is very important. That's why we're also partnering with a lot of industry, some of who provide data to us. So um, our offer in terms of data is very expansive. Um, we also have a lot of international cooperations with other open data projects. I'm not going to list them all, but um, you can you can have a look later on the recording. Um, so to get what we are actually offering. Um, so we EmotNet exists out of a central port north. A portal um, available through www.emotnet.eu and from the central portal we offer data in seven thematic areas bathymetry that, that's that's the depth of the ocean geology um, biology chemistry physics seabed dots and human activities within each of these thematic areas we offer data these are the the, the raw observations made by uh, from from vessels for example um, we offer data products which are already processed or, or uh, processed data, harmonized data, which have been collected um, or, da or data that's the result from modeling outputs based on the raw data. We offer metadata, so all the description of how the data was collected and also data services. With this, we, we mean catalogs where you can look through the metadata to find what you're looking for, uh, download services, visualization services, as well as APIs to um, uh, automatically fetch the exact kind of data that you need, with, for example, within an application, a mobile app or a web app. Um, so um, to really get a very good overview of what we have available, I recommend you access our, our data and data products portfolio. Um, there's a, the, the URL is on the page and you can also scan the QR code. Um, and you, you'll see in this portfolio, we have labeled data sets uh, at different levels of processing. Some of it is the raw data, others is quality controlled. And then we have the data products, which are really model or analysis outputs and harmonized uh, larger data sets. So please go and visit that and have a look. Um, in the rest of my presentation, I'm kind of going to go through our different um, portals, what they have to offer. And um, uh, starting at the central portal. Um, so the central portal is the single point of access to, to all of the data we have available. Um, and there you can access each of the thematic portals. Uh, and we also have there uh, several data services, a catalog to, to look for data, a map viewer to visualize it, uh, and data and web services to download and, and to also find the information about the APIs. Um, first thematic area, bathymetry, they offer um, both metadata and data and data products. Um, the kind of data they offer are bathymetric survey data sets. Um, we have a tool where you can visualize where these surveys are located and you can filter by a whole bunch of parameters to, to be able to make sure you find what you're looking for. Uh, we also have a bathymetry data product. This is a digital terrain model of the European Sea region at uh, unprecedented resolution, uh, better than any existing alternative out there. Um, you can visualize it in the portal um, and we even have a 3D option. Uh, and you can also, from there, you can also download the data directly. 
Um, we have a, a metadata catalog where you can search through the different things that are available. There's a lot of filtering and querying options. Um, and, of, and as I said, we also have web services. Um, these are APIs to visualize or download the data. And these all support the Open Geospatial Consortium standards. So we follow international standards, also inspire standards to make sure our data is, is, is as uh, easy to, to find and, to, and as interoperable as possible. Moving on to the next thematic area, which is geology. Um, geology offers data on the substrate of the seabed, the, the underlying geology, the coastal behavior, are the coasts eroding or, or not, events and probabilities, these are uh, data on earthquakes, marine minerals is data on where different mineral deposits, which may have economic interest, are located, submerged landscapes is more archaeology, um, and then we have a bunch of indexes of different types of geological data are situated. Um, they also have a, offer a map viewer where you can visualize the data before you download it. For example, this is uh, an example of the map viewer with the seabed street map. Um, they offer data products at a range of scales and they're to download. Um, then we also have um, here, we have a catalog where you can browse through what's available and we, we, uh, it also supports all the different APIs. Um, seabed habitats, um, they have maps on data of where different habitats have been observed. They also have data sets on, on the OSPAR habitats and on the habitats in the EU habitats directive. Um, these, they include so individual habitat maps from, from specific surveys or research projects, um, also modeled maps of specific habitats and the EU sea map, which is a broad scale habitat map. Um, just to quickly explain you what is a habitat map, basically it combines a whole bunch of different data from substrate to the hydrodynamics to the actual biology we find in specific region and tries to predict where the different habitats and ecosystems will occur. Um, so combining all of this data, we are able to, to give you a very good estimate of, of where specific habitats are to be found, which could be a very important thing for for example, marine spatial planning, where do you want to protect the environment from human activities? Um, you can access all the data through through the, the, the Seabed Habitats portal. Um, they also have a map viewer where you can visualize, for example, here the EU sea map. Um, they have a catalog, uh, which is the ICES metadata catalog, where again, you can browse for everything that's available. Um, and again, they support the, the, the OGC APIs. Then physics data. Um, this is the, the portal. They offer data on waves, water temperature, water salinity, currents, optical properties, sea level, atmospheric data, water conductivity, winds, river, and underwater noise. So a whole bunch of physical parameters that can be measured in the ocean. Um, they have a map viewer where you can visualize. They again have a catalog and they also support the, o the Open Geospatial Consortium standard APIs, as well as they have a, a few more specific APIs as well. Um, they have a map viewer where you can see where data is collected and you can even get a near real time time series of uh, different physical parameters. Um, uh, okay, and, and, and again, they, they, they have a catalog. Um, where you can find uh, everything about the data that you need. Um, and they offer the, the API. So chemical data, um, uh, they offer, uh, this is the, the, the chemical data, the chemistry data portal. They again offer data and data products, mainly on, on, uh, on chemical substances related to eutrophication to contamination of the environment, as well as on marine litter. They offer uh, a, a service where you can uh, look through the metadata of the different data sets and shop for data using a shopping basket mechanism. Um, they have a map viewer where you can visualize, for example, different concentration maps. You can make profiles uh, before you download the data. Uh, they have uh, the, they support the sextant catalog where you have access to all the different metadata. 
and they also offer uh, the different APIs, the web services, um, which you can use in a, in a specific application you may want to build. Um, so um, almost there, uh, we're in biology, biological data. So that's mainly data on species occurrence of different functional groups. Um, biotic measurements uh, of where uh, species occur, abiotic parameters, the, the, the conditions under which species live, and then um, also information on different sampling methodologies of these species. They also offer more integrated products on uh, abundance maps of, of different species, um, and as well ICs, operational oceanographic products and services, um, all available through the bi EMOPnet biology portal, um, they again support the same features. You have a map viewer where you can visualize things. You have a metadata catalog where you can search for the different data sets. And they also support the different web services. Um, finally, human activities data. They provide data sets on uh, the human use of the oceans and the seas. Um, this is data, for example, on aggregate extraction. Where are we mining the seabed, aquaculture, cables, dredging sites, fisheries, uh, and, and, and much more. Um, they have a map viewer where you can visualize uh, all of the data and where you can directly download it. Uh, and from the download page, you immediately can find data, the metadata, as well as the different um, APIs, that's this WFS and WMS link, um, to download and visualize the data through an API. Um, so this was a, a, a quick overview of what EmailPlus has to offer, um, and I, I welcome any questions. Uh, thank you, Tim, very much for your presentation. Um, I have actually uh, three questions. Um, I will place them to you. Uh, the first of them is from uh, Simon. He says. He asked, is there already a way to combine all, all the different portals? Yes, so um, you can um, search uh, most of the data that's available through the different portals from our central portal. Our central portal offers uh, a catalog where you can look through the data from all the portals together. Uh, and there um, you can find uh, what you're looking for without specifically going to a thematic portal. So there we have combined the metadata of the different thematic portals. Um, so I, I think that's that's it. And th there's also a map viewer there, which combines a lot of the, the data products from each of the different thematic portals. Thank you very much. Um, another question um, from Maria. You mentioned inspired data. Could you please briefly explain what, what this is for participants not familiar with uh, the term and its context? All right. So INSPIRE is a set of guidelines um, created by the European Commission to um, improve the, the sharing and the interoperability of geospatial data, so data with a spatial component. And it, it's a set of guidelines and, and standards um, which, if you follow them, allows for integration between geospatial data from different providers. And EmotNet uh, tries to follow these guidelines, follow these standards, so that our data can be seamlessly integrated with data coming from other providers. Okay, thank you. And um, thank you very much. And, uh, and then the last question is from Simon as well. Is there a way to forecast? as the European Green Deal goes until 2050? So, um, EMOTNET tries to focus mainly on, on, on data and in situ data that's collected, as well as products that are derived from it and does not offer forecasts um, at this moment. However, with the data, you, you could build your own models which you can then combine with, with, with forecasts, for example, from, from climate or general circulation models to, um, to, to actually extend some of the observational data and try to predict what, what, what will be the outcome. Um, so so EmailNet really focused on observations and, and not as much on, on, on forecasting. But of course, you can use our data if you want to build a forecasting model. 
Perfect. Thank you very much for your presentation again. Then we Thank you. The, <laughs> then we go now with the European Union uh, Intellectual Property Office. So I give you the floor to Francisco. Please, you can start whenever you want. Um, okay. Hello. Um, uh, my name is Francisco Garcia Valero. I work uh, in the EU IPO here in, in Alicante. And um, I would like to present you some. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Uh, no, we can see uh, the WebEx. Ah, okay. Sorry. Um, it will take me a second. Okay. Just a second, please. Um, can you share your screen again, Francisco? Okay. Okay. Now it's loading. Okay. Now it's. Now it's Good, good. Because I here I have I working at home because of the coronavirus, and I working here with a television of a secondary screen, and it's a little bit compli complicated. Well, I, I was saying that yes, I I work in the in the European Union Intellectual Property Office, that is a place in in Alicante, uh, and um, I'm going to present uh, some data we have for for this. Um, uh, first challenge of the uh, EU Data Tone 2020. Um, the, um, the IPO is the European uh, Union Intellectual Property Office, and we are responsible for managing this is registering and, and also taking care of oppositions about the. Uh, EU trademark and the uh, EU designs. Uh, we register around uh, 135,000 trademarks per year and close to 100,000 uh, designs. Um, in this uh, uh, office, uh, we host also what is called the European Observatory on, on Infringement of Intellectual Property Rights that it was before in the commission and from, I think it was created in uh, 2009 and from 2000 and 2012 is hosted here in, in, in our office. Uh, and uh, I working in this uh, European observatory, in fact, um, and the observatory is a network that brings uh, together public and private stakeholders to improve the fight against piracy and counterfeiting. In fact, the observatory is um, uh, a network for all the 27 member states. There is uh, 67 uh, European and international associations and private sector. There is also eight associations presenting uh, consumers and, and civil society. There is one uh, member of the parliament and also we have the presence of the European Commission, but also other international organizations, the Europol, Eurojust, uh, European Patent Office, WIPO, and others. Uh, our, our role... Our, our goals mainly are three, is um, to provide facts and evidences to support effective policies, and this is the area where I work in now, uh, create tools and resources to, to improve the fight against uh, IP infringement, and uh, raise awareness um, of the importance of uh, intellectual property uh, and the negative effects of uh, counterfeiting and piracy. Uh, we do, um, in the first goal, where I, I work in, we do studies um, about I, uh, IP contribution, about infringement uh, of IP, and about uh, the Europeans and the IP. Um, 
we do, for example, studies like uh, what is the contribution uh, to the turnover and unemployment uh, added value to the economy from uh, IT intensive industries. We also quantify what is the the infringement on on at the European Union level and uh, see what is the impact on on added value on employment and taxes. And uh, finally, we do studies about how the society perceives uh, IP, IP rights. And, and we do uh, also a jump uh, uh, and SMA scoreboards. Um, what is going to be the contribution uh, for, for this challenge? Uh, well, um, I'm going to, we are going to put um, uh, available some data that we used for our last study on the IP contribution. Uh, and I think it will fit with the challenge one because um, uh, we have information about uh, about products, uh, we have information about regions and cities that could, could be exploited for, for challenge one. Uh, because uh, the challenge say that at least two of, of the these uh, data sets have to, be, have to be combined. We have also a link uh, between our uh, um, databases and the databases of the uh, European Patent Office. Uh, what is what are the data? Well, the data we are going to offer is we are going to offer information about the uh, full set of uh, uh, European Union trademarks. Uh, we are going to put also available detailed uh, information, detailed product descriptions in English uh, about uh, about these trademarks. Uh, we have also data about uh, uh, community designs, also from the beginning, with a product classification. We have information about the owners of the trademarks and, and designs, uh, with uh, geo info. That is, we have the postal codes and the NATs uh, of the different owners. We have also information about some of these companies, if they are my small, medium, or large companies. And as I, I say before, we have also a link to the European uh, Patent Office uh, applicants. Then it could be possible for the people to see if uh, some companies are at the same time uh, registering uh, trademarks, designs, and patents, and in which field. Um, the, um, some of these ideas uh, it will be um, try to identify in the description of uh, the trademarks, products, uh, terms related with the green economy, and uh, also in the place in the in the description of the of the designs, and try to study the, the evolution of these trademarks and designs uh, by regions and city, and also try to link with the European Patent Office. Um, uh, patent related to green economy. I'm going to show to you some examples of the data will be all in SV because are part of a, an economic study and it's just data as as we produce for the research. And um, for example, we have here um, data on on trademarks uh, we have uh, information about uh, about uh, who is the owner uh, what was the receiving date and the explicit date and also we, you will have data on what is the description of the of the trademark for example if you take the first the first uh, trademark here you see that the, the the trademark is sona.eu and uh, the owner have described this trademark in manufacture and sale of sona heaters and sona rooms by searching by searching in the in the description you could be searching uh, terms like uh, 
ecological, for example, you will find uh, uh, you will find the trademarks that that have, um, um, uh, for example, this one uh, bio biogen. There is uh, a trademark uh, that is described as ecological fuels. You have uh, in these databases, in this table, we have you have the application code. By the application code, you can trace to the owner, and, to, and tracing to the owner, you can see the size of the owner. And you can see the postcode of the owner and the region of the owner. But also with another table, you could trace uh, this um, uh, owner to European Patent Office to see if uh, this owner was also uh, filing a patent. Then, um, coming back to the presentation, um, the tables that will be available will be uh, five sets of tables, one table with uh, all the trademarks, uh, another tables with the descriptions of the products that are covered by these trademarks, another table with designs, and then uh, a table with information about the owners of the trademarks and, and, and designs, and a link to from these companies to the uh, filing in EPO. Uh, the table with the trademarks uh, is composed by nearly uh, 4, 000, 4 million uh, records. Uh, that is um, uh, uh, all the trademarks that have been that are uh, um, in, in an status that is valid in our database from the beginning. And uh, you will have information about the filing date, the, the, the class of product, and the uh, registration and expiration uh, date. You will have, as I said before, information about uh, the description of the products, or the goods and services in English, and in other table. You will have information about uh, the designs, about one and, uh, one and a half million of of designs with information about the products as well, with the uh, receiving date and uh, expiration date. The information I mentioned before about uh, three, uh, three quarters of a million of uh, owners in our database with information about the postal code, that is the, the city or the NATS, which are the, the uh, Eurostat information about the different uh, regions and the size, if it's a micro, a small, medium, or large company. And then you will have a link between the, our, our database and the European Patent Office owner's ID. Then if you have access to the, to the EPO um, databases, you could be making the link on how owners are concurrently filing or registering uh, trademark designs or, or patents. And I, as I said before, the idea when you have um, uh, all this uh, information, all this database that we have uh, used, we have produced for our last study, a good idea could be identify the terms uh, related to green economy in the trademark descriptions identify the probable classes uh, in the uh, uh, Locarno classes are is a classification used by WIPO to identify the, the products in, in designs. You could also try to identify uh, which uh, of these Locarno classes are more probable to be in the green economy. Then est and study the evolution of these trademarks and designs in the time by cities and regions and then try to link uh, these uh, filings or this uh, registry of new trademarks and designs with uh, patents filed or try to register by this, the same companies in the European Patent Office, and then try to make clusters and try to summarize facts. Uh, this, is, uh, this was my presentation. Thank you. Francisco, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we have here 
couple of questions. Uh, first of them is uh, with which data set could we link the patent data sets to create new insights? Well, uh, we, we don't provide data on, on patent, but if you have access to the, to the data on, on patents from uh, European Patent Office, for example, a product called PatStat, we provide uh, one of our tables is the link between, between our, this table, the table EPO is the link between our owner IDs and the owner's IDs of the EPO. Then uh, uh, you have access to both our data set and to data set of the EPO, then this is this table is just a link saying what is the EU, EU IPO uh, key um, in our office is the same company as uh, this other uh, EPO owner in, in the European Patent Office. Then you can you can identify with this table uh, the the cross activity uh, or the concurrent activity in patents and, and trademarks. Uh, of companies, and because we also provide information about uh, some detailed information about the owners, like uh, I said before, uh, localization of size, you could also infer all other uh, information. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have another question. Um, if I'm a participant and I want to uh, use uh, your data and I want to apply for the challenge uh, European Green Deal, how do you think the participant can use your data for the European Green Deal? Well, uh, I, I say, as I said uh, before, is I think uh, the idea the idea is to try to identify in the try to the, because uh, when people are are uh, filing the trademark, they are describing uh, sometimes in quite in detail what is the product of the of the trademark, and the the idea is to see how the the description of the product is changing in the time, and, uh, and how if there is some patterns for these changes depending of the of the localization. Uh, the more and more you see, you will see that. There are terms like uh, like recycling or ecological that are ap appearing in the in the descriptions of the trademarks, and the idea the idea is to to see uh, to make a, a tool that it could um, put some insight on on the time evolution and the geographical evolution of these terms in 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 Europe. Okay, thank you very much. I think there's no further questions. So um, we can go to our next speaker. There is uh, Maria from uh, EASO, European Asylum Support Office. So Maria, whenever you want, you can start. I cannot hear you very well. It's the volume, I think. Hello? Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, now it works. Okay, so I took out the headphones. Uh, just a minute to, to share the screen. Okay, so I am here, I'm Maria Papayano. I'm coming from Information Analysis Unit of EASO. EASO is the European Asylum Support Office, so the data that we are collecting uh, refer to the asylum trends uh, in the European Union. 
I will present you two different data sets that we currently have and I will update the, uh, the PowerPoint that we have shared with you before so as to make it available to all uh, participants in case they need to uh, keep track of what we are going to present uh, now. So, so we have uh, two major uh, projects that we are going to present to you right now. The first one is the annual report on the situation of asylum in the EU. Uh, you can find it, as you can see, uh, online through the EASO website. Uh, the annual report is based on the EASO regulation and uh, the idea, the scope here, is to provide a comprehensive overview of developments at European level and uh, at uh, national level regarding uh, relevant developments in asylum and reception systems. Uh, we also include here uh, legislation, uh, legislative policy and jurisprudential developments. So with regard to this uh, product, um, what you can find of interest is the important developments at the national level. And uh, so what you can see here is a data set um, on uh, how, what has been, uh, has, what are the major developments in um, every member states for the past year. This information are collected uh, through the member states, uh, NGOs, UNHCR and the European Migration Network. Uh, the process, the methodology behind the report is that member states validate the content and it is approved by our management board. So what you can find here, uh, my colleague has uploaded the data set in a word format i will find to show you exactly where let me check no it should be here uh, I will include the, the exact uh, link uh, of the Word document, so you can find in a Word document all, all the relevant developments. Um, and they are grouped and listed, as you can see here, um, in the screenshot. So this is one of the, the products that we are interested in making available to you. And the other one is uh, an online database we have, is the Information Documentation System on Case Law. Um, this will be renamed to EASO Case Law Database um, because it will become uh, the main tool of reference for our EASO products regarding jurisprudence. So, uh, what is the idea here is that uh, we developed this tool. This is an online tool. Uh, you can see the URL. Um, the, uh, the idea here is to we needed to create a technical solution that would allow us the registration and management uh, of uh, case law references, uh, case law input we collect from the member states. And um, this also, uh, these also are data that they feed back to the annual report that I saw you before. So we have created an online and searchable repository uh, of case law uh, related to common European asylum system and its implementation. And uh, it is available to, to the public. Anyone can access it. So you don't need to register or anything. Um, and the idea is to cover the information needs uh, regarding jurisprudential developments. What are the main functions of the system? So apart from that, the fact that it is available online, you can. I will guide you through quickly uh, to the main elements to have a brief idea. So you can see all the latest registrations. Uh, these are all the latest latest uh, cases that we have registered and um, incorporated in the system. Um, you can find a list of uh, the latest uh, ten ones, the last ten ones. Uh, all this information is also available chronologically arranged uh, in a digest where you can find all the cases by date, uh, year, month and date of publication. Uh, 
so you can uh, easily access it this way and also you can find uh, a search function so all, all the cases are uh, searchable through the search engine via uh, virus elements that you can point so you can uh, search by date of decision by year of decision by country of decision there are drop down lists by courts, uh, we have a list of courts integrated uh, hereby. So, for instance, if you click on Austria, you get uh, the Austrian uh, courts. Uh, you can find, uh, you can search by type uh, of um, product. So, if it is a country report, a decision, a judgment, um, you can f search by ECLI number. ECLI is the European uh, number. A number system that the courts are following. You can uh, search by keywords or relevant uh, provisions. So how a, a case looks looks like? I will show you one of the latest registrations. So all the cases uh, have uh, the same um, presentation. What we try to cover here is to cover all the main elements, meaning country of decision. Uh, court name, I will zoom in, date of decision, the title, as well as uh, abstract, which we try to keep it descriptive, uh, or uh, refer to the official uh, press releases, the official summaries of the courts. Uh, we have defined keywords uh, so as to give you uh, the flavor of the case to, to make it uh, easily accessible. Uh, you can find the source. Uh, with links to the source and also additional information that might be linked to the case. Uh, one of the added values of the system is that it provides you with a reference system, so you can use this reference in case you need to uh, use the case in uh, other products or to refer to it. Uh, one of the functionalities uh, of the system is that everybody can uh, submit uh, its own cases, meaning cases of interest, uh, for the for the database related to asylum, and uh, we are then reviewing uh, the cases and come back uh, to the original uh, providers uh, uh, with additional information if needed or um, just to thank them. What uh, you may also find here and um, these are the, uh, the additional resources that you might uh, be interested in uh, combining is that we have an overview of all the judicial institutions and the national case law databases that we have identified. So this might also be of uh, use and of interest uh, for um, your work. So apart from the European institutions like the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights with the database sets here, you can also find a full list of courts and tribunals related to asylum um, in this page. The idea of the system is to, to provide you with a common point of reference. So we try to put all the available resources related to asylum jurisprudence in one place and then uh, guide you, refer you back to the original source. We don't uh, intend to replicate, to uh, substantiate, uh, to, to replicate the information in the mean to uh, feel that the national databases are not of any use. What we try to do here is to put all related to asylum information in one place because uh, the courts, of course, have other functions. So it's not very easy to identify the case law in the databases as well. Uh, right now, we have 700 cases registered. This is uh, ongoing work. It's not uh, uh, set or final. So we are trying our best in order to incorporate as many information as possible. And uh, we are in the um, right now, we are uh, drafting the annual report on the situation of asylum of last year uh, of 2019. So we are collecting input from member states courts and tribunals network of EASO, uh, NGOs, UNHCR, 
on uh, relevant uh, development. So uh, we are right now receiving also inputs for uh, jurisprudential developments. I hope it wasn't too fast and uh, I will uh, update the um, the PowerPoint with all this information step by step in case you find it useful for your own uh, use and uh, reference. Do you have any questions for, for me? Thank you very much, Maria, for your presentation. And um, we have a couple of questions. Um, mm, mm, okay, first of all of them uh, is uh, if is the annual the, the data behind the annual report available in formats other than PDF? Um, yes, there is a word that it is uploaded, and I will share exactly the link with you, uh, so to send with everybody regarding this legislative uh, this uh, overviews of developments that I show you. This is available on Word format as well. Great, thank you. And then another question is: Is the mainly textual data? Uh, it's qual qualitative uh, data mainly, yes. Uh, in the annual report, you can find also quantitative data, but these are based on the Eurostat data. So it's another source that you can uh, you can use directly from there. Okay, perfect. And uh, how often is the repository updated? Um, so. Uh, I see how often is the repository updated. We are doing daily work on that. So we try to update um, in a daily, frequent basis, if not daily. Right now we are in the peak of work because we are receiving inputs from all our stakeholders. So it will be populated. And uh, if it is the whole repository down downloadable, uh, I cannot really, I, I don't really know that. I, all the results, when you search, you can export the results. Uh, but I haven't tested, to, I haven't tried to, to export all the results from there, to tell you the truth. I have also provided you with a sample of an Excel uh, with the main elements that we cover in case this might of, be of use for uh, the participants of this competition. I hear you because your mic is muted. Sorry. So thank you very much. So, uh, well, I will go now for the last uh, presentation we have from our colleagues from the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. So, um, I give you the floor. So, you can start whenever you want. Hey, Alexandra, you are muted. Sorry. Hey. Hello. Hello again. So uh, my name is Alexandra Valahur and the other colleagues from the from different units across the JRC. We will present the data sets that the JRC is putting forward this year um, in complement with other data sets that the JRC has put forward uh, last year uh, for this year's uh, challenge. So I will share my presentation to give uh, an idea. Okay. So who are we? Uh, the Joint Research Center, the European Commission Joint Research Center is the Commission's Science and Knowledge Service. Uh, the JRC employs scientists to carry out research in order to provide independent scientific advice and support to EU policymaking. 
Um, what we do is uh, support EU policies with independent scientific evidence throughout the whole policy cycle, creating, managing and making sense of knowledge and developing innovative tools and making them available to policymakers, anticipating emerging issues that need to be addressed at EU level, um, and um, understanding policy environments, collaborating with many organizations worldwide um, whose scientists have access to many GRC facilities through various collaboration agreements. And our work has a direct impact on the lives of citizens by contributing with research outcomes to a healthy and safe environment, secure energy supplies, sustainable mobility and consumer health and safety, um, and many other topics. Um, the Joint Research Center um, it was first set up in uh, 1959, so it has over 50 years of scientific experience and we are continually building our expertise in uh, knowledge production and knowledge management. You can have more information about the JRC um, through the EU Science Hub um, portal. Um, here you can also see the different science areas. So. Why I am telling you about this is because there are um, many different things that are being worked on at the JRC. So that is why there is a wealth of uh, data sets that the JRC is uh, putting forward and that you can also access directly many other different data sets that maybe we're, we are not going to talk about today or we haven't talked about um, in past editions of the uh, EU Datathon but that you can find through the JRC catalog or through the open data portal. So there are many different science areas that um, where the JRC is producing data sets that you can find in these uh, portals and that you can combine uh, together with the data sets that we are presenting today or um, other data sets. Uh, so the overall aim um, is to put forward to the public open data on many different topics. As I've said, they are um, accessible through the JRC Open Data Catalog or the Open Data Portal. The agreement is that uh, for scientists inside the JRC that once the, their data sets are in the uh, JRC Data Catalog and it is compulsory for us to put our data there, they are um, automatically brought into the Open Data Portal. Um, in 2019, the JRC already put forward three data sets for challenge three, which was tackling climate change, uh, and two of them were used by the winning teams. And um, these data sets, before we start presenting the data sets uh, that we specifically want to show this year, um, uh, we think that they are really useful also to be used, especially for challenge one this year. So please, um, our first um, uh, suggestion is to, to look at the webinar four from uh, EU Datathon 2019, challenge three. Um, and there uh, we have the presentation on the three data sets that we presented last year, which is EDGAR, the emissions database for global atmospheric research, the urban atlas of cities built on the global human settlement layer, and the Digital Observatory for Protected Areas. They have a, an um, immense amount, uh, an immense wealth of, um, of information on emissions and uh, cities and GDP and populations and many other uh, very interesting uh, data that uh, can be used in order to tackle um, environment-related uh, challenges. So, now I give the floor to my colleagues who are going to present the data that we want to put forward this year um, uh, for challenges uh, one, two, and um, four. Okay, so I suppose I should start. Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Simone Salotti. I work at the Jersey Civil and um, I work in the Romolo team. Uh, the Ro Romolo is a, a general equilibrium model, uh, but I won't talk about this uh, general equilibrium model. I will talk about a, a, a small part of, of the work we do, but uh, it's an interesting data set that I'm going to present. Uh, 
it's um, it's reasonably small in the sense that it's uh, an Excel file uh, containing data for uh, the NATS2 regions of Europe. Um, so let's start. I have a few slides. I will be brief. Uh, the regional, it's a regional transport cost data set. So this file, this Excel file contains data on distances among regions, among NATS2 regions. Uh, NATS2 is a statistical definition used by Eurostat. Uh, in some countries, uh, it overlaps uh, perfectly with the, with the regions, the administrative regions of the government, for instance, uh, in Spain and in Italy, let's say. Uh, but in some other countries, it's just a statistical artifact, let's say, but uh, it's used uh, for, for in data set uh, uh, when, you, when you go to Eurostat and take official data, you find data at NATS2 level. So uh, what did we do? Uh, we constructed a data set containing distances uh, and uh, first of all, the simple geodesic distance, so as the crow flies, then distance by road, uh, then we computed the, the, the variable which was important for us in terms of the model that we use, but that can be used also uh, completely independently from the model. So the transport costs uh, that uh, a, a, a heavy duty truck, a 40 tons truck, uh, has to pay to, to to bring goods from one region to another or to move goods within the same region, the same NATS2 region. So I will talk briefly about this, uh, this type of data. So to repeat, it's simply, let's say, uh, in this, uh, an Excel file with distances. So uh, distances, travel time, this distance cost, time costs, and total transport costs of a truck moving goods in Europe. Uh, on, on roads. So the data is, uh, I mean, these are the first four lines of the data set. Uh, so you see the region from which the truck starts its travel, the regions where it's going. So in this case, it's Austria, uh, AT11, it's one of the NATS2 regions of Austria, going to the same region. Uh, you find a number of variables. One is the geodesic distance, so as the crow flies. One is the distance by road, and we calculated optimal routes in order to, to find out uh, how many kilometers, basically, the truck has to travel, the time it takes, the total cost, all the time-related costs, and all the distance-related costs. So, uh, as I, as I said, it's a relatively small data set, but there are uh, a lot of information in it, and there are a lot of assumptions made in order to construct this type of data. As the first slide was saying, I'm going back to the first slide, of course, the distance as the crow flies is, the, is pretty straightforward, but already the distance by road has to rely on some assumptions because which road are you taking to go from point A to point B? Uh, you need to use road data, you need to calculate optimal routes and so on and so forth. When you go to travel time, you need to make assumptions on the um, on the speed limits, on the road characteristics. So there are, you you add assumptions when you go to more complicated uh, uh, variables. And of course, the most complicated of all in this particular data set is the total cost of moving a truck from point A to point B, which includes both both distance and time related costs. So uh, here you see. A, a non-comprehensive list of the things that are taken into account in this data set, but I'll try to to briefly explain how it's done. Uh, so this is uh, a, an aerial view, an aerial view of uh, the city of Seville, where the GRC is located. Um, but it's just an example. Uh, we used uh, population data and road network data to uh, build basically a. a a data set of, of kilometers of roads and potential starting and ending points of the travels of the trucks. Uh, then we sample these, uh, these potential centroids. We call them centroids. So for instance, here you see uh, an aerial view of Andalusia, the, the region of, of Seville, the NATS2 region. And in this case, in order to calculate the within Andalusia uh, cost of moving a truck, we uh, sampled uh, between 60 and 150 centroids, and we calculated optimal routes between those centroids, 
and then we uh, with the assumptions on the cost of fuel on the road characteristics and so on and so forth we uh, we calculated the the cost actually of moving the truck we repeated this uh, this exercise many times uh, in order to bootstrap some uh, error some uh, some sampling errors and so on and so forth so to to get with to get out with uh, some estimates which are reasonable um, so that's basically my presentation it's very uh, very brief uh, it's simply <laughs> the data set is simply an excel uh, file with many distances in it and uh, not only you find the total time related cost and the total distance related cost but also you find all the single uh, elements of that so for instance if you take the data set itself first of all there is a readme so when you download the data set you you find all the all the the, the whole agenda uh, and you can understand uh, the variables what they are and how they're constructed so here you see the the, the data set itself so the nuts two regions are here and then you see the series of variable uh, the distance the two distances and then time related distance related and all the components and i won't get into the details of why there is an arithmetic and a harmonic uh, uh, averages but it, it, I won't get into the details just because I can uh, point you to the to two documents which explain in in detail the data set, the construction of the data set. Uh, you find this uh, short policy insight. It's just four pages, not too technical. It's a new data set of distance and time related transport costs for EU regions. You can download it freely from the Science Hub, which is the JRC website. Uh, here's the the link. Uh, to the to our pages and you can both download the, the data set from from this section of the website and also find this uh, this policy insight and in the policy insight you will also see uh, the the reference to the full technical report this is the technical report it's uh, 30 pages explaining in detail how the data set is constructed and why it is used so uh, it's a uh, Pretty straightforward if you're thinking about using uh, data on distances of moving goods within Europe, within regions of Europe, and among regions of Europe. Uh, this is the, the data set that you can use uh, for this uh, for this data ton challenge. And uh, that's it. Okay. So, uh, the next speaker is Davide. We will also present uh, from the JRC that can be used either for the for Challenge 1 or for Challenge 2. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. <coughs> My name is Davide Antoni. I work uh, at the Territorial Development Unit uh, at the JRC. Can you confirm you can see my presentation? Okay, <clears throat> I assume this is our, yes. So I'm going to talk about uh, a database that is called <clears throat> Ardeco. Uh, for those of you who have already worked with Ameco, uh, which is DG ECFIN uh, annual uh, macroeconomic uh, database of the European Commission, uh, you will find uh, some similarity in the acronyms. And this is not uh, a coincidence. Uh, there is a relationship uh, between these two databases. So I think it's the result of a joint effort of the Joint Research Center and Director General for the Regional and the Urban Policy in DG Radio. And it consists of a wide range of regional, uh, socioeconomic and demographic indicators for EU member states, for the United Kingdom, and uh, where possible uh, also for regions uh, from EFTA candidate or potential candidate countries. ARDECO is uh, constructed on the basis of uh, common methodologies uh, where concepts, uh, definitions, uh, classifications and accounting rules have been harmonized to enable cross-country and uh, cross-regional comparison. So what is the, the aim uh, of, uh, of ARDECO? The aim of ARDECO is to provide uh, long and complete time series of regional and sub-regional data, NATS2 and NATS3, 
Simone uh, has already explained uh, a little bit what NAS2 is. Uh, uh, so it's the, the nomenclature for uh, statistical uh, territorial units. Uh, NAS2 are uh, regions, while NAS3 are uh, districts uh, or uh, provinces. Uh, the, the aim is also to ensure uh, the best linkage with uh, official information at the regional level from uh, Eurostat and at the national level from uh, AMECO and also ensure consistency across uh, different uh, variables. So what is uh, the, the problem, the main problem? The main problem is that uh, regional boundaries, uh, differently from uh, national boundaries, uh, tend to change over time. And so uh, these changes happen uh, every three years, more or less. And you see here from a table from yours, that's what you will experience uh, when you look for a time series uh, for uh, uh, specific uh, variables. Uh, in this case, uh, for France, uh, you have uh, information starting from 2015 and nothing before. And this is happening because uh, with the latest version, that's 2016, uh, in France, uh, a change has been introduced and this has caused uh, this uh, break in series. So we try to uh, to fix uh, this issue and how is the Aldeco uh, structure? So <clears throat> Aldeco, as I said, is based uh, on the NAS 2016 regional classification in its uh, first initial release. Uh, and data are uh, disaggregated by NAC sector. So the NAC is the statistical classification of uh, economic activities in the European community. Here you see uh, which variables you can find in there. So the total population, active population uh, split by civilian and total active population, employment, how it works, compensation of employees, GDP, GVA, and gross fixed capital formation. For employment, how it works, compensation of employees, uh, GVA and gross fixed capital formation, you have information by sector, while for the others you have only the, the sum, let's say the total information. You see the geographical coverage in this slide, uh, so U27 plus UK is the basic, the minimum, the very minimum, and when possible we extend it to uh, more countries. The time coverage uh, will come to it in uh, a little bit in more detail in a while. And then you see also the regional detail uh, for each uh, variable. Uh, some of them uh, are uh, limited to NATS2, others uh, go to NATS3. Uh, Comparing ADECO to other uh, similar uh, databases, uh, which are uh, Cambridge Econometrics uh, European Regional Database, Eurostat, and ANECO, you see in this uh, slide uh, what differences you can find. So ADECO has a regional focus. Uh, uh, the geographical coverage is uh, the same as uh, for Eurostat. The time coverage uh, is extended compared to Eurostat from 1980 to 2018 or 21. We'll see what this forecast is in a while. You see that the Cambridge Econometrics European Regional Database is no longer updated. So this was a source until uh, last year, let's say for uh, running this type of analysis at macroeconomic level, but uh, it's not going to be updated anymore. So Ardeco definitely is replacing uh, Cambridge uh, Econometric CRD. Uh, Excel regions uh, are uh, um, managed uh, within Ardeco while they were not in Cambridge Econometric CRD. These are uh, consulates, uh, embassies, um, military bases, uh, scientific bases, uh, offshore uh, installations. Data gaps, uh, we tend to try to, to fill all gaps in uh, Ardeco, which is not always the case. Uh, you have seen in, in Eurostat what we will uh, find with this, due to this uh, change of NATS version. Uh, and currently, we provide information in Ardeco in uh, as current prices, uh, both euros uh, and PPS, uh, and also in uh, uh, cost and prices, uh, level, reference level 2015, uh, both in euros and national currency. And then you see the split by NAC sector. We apply a six sector, sector uh, uh, split, which means uh, that information in Ardeco are based, uh, are available for agriculture, industry, construction, also retail, transport, accommodation, and food services, information and communication as one single sector, financial and business services, and uh, no market uh, services. Uh, how is it uh, built? Uh, we start from uh, tables uh, from uh, Eurostat as a starting point, uh, 
and we fill the gaps uh, as much as possible by using uh, Eurostat tables uh, in uh, archived version uh, NATS 2013. We prolong the time series backwards uh, until uh, 1980 by making use of information from Cambridge Econometrics uh, European Regional Database. Uh, year 2000 is uh, the junction point usually between the two databases. Uh, Eurostat, by definition, uh, provides the right value and we readjust uh, when there is a difference uh, values from Cambridge Econometrics uh, backwards uh, to ensure uh, uh, the, the best uh, compliance. For the forecast, uh, we provide a short-time regional forecast uh, based on a linear trend of the latest three years. Uh, whenever AMECO is also providing uh, such a forecast uh, at the national level. And absolute values are uh, uh, then converted into regional shares and rescaled to AMECO totals. Cost and prices uh, are derived by applying national and uh, sectoral deflators. Uh, uh, as uh, regional deflators uh, normally do not are not available, so we, we apply national deflators and sectoral deflators for GVA, for instance. Where can you find Adeco? You can find Adeco as part of the Knowledge Center for Territorial Policies, the URL that you find uh, in this uh, slide, uh, which is hosted on the Knowledge for Policy platform. And this is what you will find. The latest update at the moment is 21st of March, but it is updated quite uh, quite often. Uh, but it has to be kept in mind that the, ref the reference at the national level is AMECO Autumn Forecast 2019. So for the forecasts, of course, uh, the, the current shock due to the coronavirus is not uh, uh, caught. And we have to wait uh, for uh, the next uh, uh, forecast that is going to happen early May from AMECO to be reflected also at the regional level in ARDECO. The download format is an open document. Uh, for those of you who are already used to AMECO, the coding uh, in ARDECO is the same. Uh, by, the only difference is that we put an R in front of the code uh, so that it reflects the regional value. Uh, and variables are organized by domain, uh, demography, labor market, capital formation, and uh, domestic uh, product. Uh, that's uh, all. Uh, here you find uh, some references uh, to EU Science Hub and other references for the JRC. And then now available for questions, if any. Okay, before uh, going on with the rest of the presentations, um, there's a question to JRC. Can transport costs for EU regions technically be applied to a similar study for maritime transport, meeting I? ISD, ISD data with environmental data? Uh, sorry. Okay, if you put the in the chat box, you can see it. it. What do in terms of COVID? Well, we are currently providing uh, uh, some, some advice. Uh, I mean, the Commission is working, of course, uh, with some uh, teams uh, on, on COVID-19. Uh, at the moment, uh, I have I do not have a broad overview of uh, all the activities that are running uh, under uh, under this. Uh, for sure, our team is uh, engaged uh, with uh, analysis uh, on uh, the impact on tourism. Okay. Could this data also be used for your data tone? Uh, yes, of course. The data that I presented in the can uh, can be used for. Uh, for the UDATO, and they are uh, freely available uh, at the URL that I showed in the presentation. They will also be made available through other channels. One of them is the Urban Data Platform uh, Plus, uh, and they will be uh, made available via API. And uh, also the Open uh, Data Portal will, uh, will provide this data in uh, the future, not now, but it will in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so now we follow with Ricardo and Crisa. So Ricardo, if you want to start your presentation. I start to share the screen. One second. Thank you. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Ricardo Ricchi from uh, Seville, Unit B6 of uh, uh, the Journalism Center. We are working at uh, Digital Economy, 
And so for the first challenge, a euro fit for the digital age, we present basically some outputs of uh, the project in which we are working that is called AI Watch. Uh, the scope of which is to monitor the development, the uptake, and the impact of AI in uh, in Europe. We are uh, providing two two small data sets for the EU data tone 2020. I will uh, introduce the first one, so AI test data set for 2019, and then I will leave the floor to my uh, to my colleague to present Krista to present the second the second one. So the test uh, AI techno-economic segment uh, system. Basically, here what we are doing is to investigate digitalization from the point of view of technical, technological, and economic evolution. So, from an historic uh, point of view, uh, we are addressing what is uh, called the, the fourth industrial revolution. So, the industrial revolution that is happening mainly uh, today, okay, and that is based on the Internet of, uh, of Things. In this uh, in this context, a special a special role is uh, is played by artificial intelligence, in the sense that thanks to uh, new and increased computational power and uh, the development of new algorithms, AI has become nowadays pervasive in the sense that we have experience of AI in our mobile, in our car automated vehicles, in almost everything, a lot of things that we uh, that we do. At the point that worldwide institutions are concerned about what is called technological sovereignty, so basically technological strength and uh, the possibility to condition on uh, competitors in uh, in economic in economy, especially in economy. So our research, uh, what is uh, uh, which are which are our questions? We uh, we investigate who are the economic players involved in the supply of AI. When I say economic players, we refer to uh, firms, research institutions, uh, governmental institutions that are involved in the supply of AI-related products or services. We want to know where are they located, how they do perform, what does AI mainly consist of. So uh, in the large technological domain of the AI, which are the technological subdomains. And moreover, we want to know also, we want to have some insights about uh, the uh, activities of research and development that are done in the context of artificial intelligence. So the data that we provide uh, is basically this one. Uh, so we have a distribution of AI players worldwide. We have distinctions between firms, uh, research institutes, governmental institutions. We know we have computed some indicators about the performance of the players. So for example, no, uh, average number of, uh, of patents. We also know uh, the involvement of uh, several areas in, uh, in the different and distinct AI subdomains. So, for example, computer vision, natural language processing, machine learning, uh, car automated vehicles, robotics, and, and so on. Uh, we investigated and we provide information uh, about the AI industry. So, which are the characteristics of the firms that are involved in AI uh, supply? And so, we provide information about the age, size, and industrial sectors of these firms. Uh, and for, moreover, finally, we also have a, a distribution of players that are active uh, in research and, uh, and development. How the data is structured? Uh, they are common separated values files, so they're very um, easy to, to download, to import in whatever kind of uh, software. We computed everything in uh, uh, aggregated, uh, they are aggregated data, and we provide multiple geographical granularities. So we have uh, worldwide macro areas, so uh, US, China, U28, uh, Canada, rest of Asian country, rest of American countries, just to have an idea. We computed everything also for worldwide countries, uh, and here U28 is considered as a single area. And we provide also information about uh, the detail of U28 member state. I have to, to say that the data is referred for, uh, to the period 2009-2018, and therefore we still uh, 
consider EU, uh, EU28 with the UK included. The data set of this part are two, uh, technically, in the sense that there is one for the comparative advantages in AI technological subdomains, and the other one for the distribution of AI uh, economic player, performances, the industry, and what about the R&D. The links to the data uh, and where you can also find, of course, a legend because there are a lot of variables. So here you can find, there you can find all the information uh, to, to understand what there are uh, these variables about. And there is a temporary link that is uh, already active and then it will be, the data will be loaded also in a permanent uh, repository but it is not uh, active, uh, active yet. Finally, what you can do with this uh, with this data? The provided information is key to understand the role of different areas in uh, what we call the AI ecosystem. So this is the information that we are providing. Nevertheless, given the fact that uh, AI is uh, extremely important and, perv and pervasive in several aspects of our uh, society and economy, uh, this data can be matched with information about uh, cities, about the population, about societies, uh, gender gaps, gender balancement, job, evolution of tasks, uh, environment, climate change, and of course also about uh, uh, what about the, uh, the finance. Possible match are uh, very large, I mean almost unlimited, and I think it's up to the creativity of the uh, of those that will apply to the to the competition. Uh, just a final slide from my part. Here you can find some more information. We have a dashboard. On the left, you can see a screenshot and also a. Uh, the link and on the right uh, this is the copy page of uh, the report that we just uh, published here you can you can you could find some more more detailed and structured information and analysis about uh, what basically i have uh, introduced uh, now i leave the floor to uh, chris for the second part Uh, you hear me now? Okay, you can go. Okay, so I'm. Uh, uh, I have shared. I think my screen already. No, it's not. Ah, okay. One minute. I will try again. So I hope that now you see my screen. Uh, the second data set from our uh, common project with Ricardo is the selected AI breakthroughs for the AI watch timeline. Uh, it seems a bit complicated as a title. And the question would be, why this data set? What do you want to do with this? Uh, the straightforward answer is that we wanted to make a visualization of the main breakthroughs on artificial intelligence. And then the question would be, and why would this be useful? The reason is that in the AI Watch project, we have another task that is the monitoring of the artificial intelligence technology evolution. And the first thing that we thought that we wanted to do was to look back at the history of artificial intelligence and analyze the trends that are there. Trends in terms of insights, behavior, interest etc so we had to do two things one was to identify important breakthroughs in the history of artificial intelligence and by the way this is uh, not a finished uh, uh, process it's a never-ending process and you can always provide your feedback by uh, filling our survey that we link uh, uh, to here and then we should classify the breakthroughs that we have identified in a way that would give us these insights. And the classification should be done in a way that makes sense for artificial intelligence. So we went to the work that our colleagues in AI Watch did in order to define artificial intelligence. And we took the domains that they identified in order to characterize the breakthroughs that we had identified. 
So we uh, made our data set. This data set uh, is very simple. It's a CSV file again. And for each breakthrough, we have the year, the title, the description, uh, its classification uh, in terms of uh, artificial uh, intelligence domains. In fact, we have the primary AI domain that is mandatory and optionally we can have a secondary AI domain and a subdomain that is much more specific. And finally, if this breakthrough is a uh, European Union activity. Why? Because we want also to see which is the European context and there are also developments that are related to the artificial intelligence, maybe not only to artificial intelligence like G DPR have been initiated uh, by the European Union and we would like to keep track of them. So the data set is uh, there and what can somebody do? He can do something uh, similar to what we have done. You will see here our first attempt of a visualization of the artificial intelligence uh, history, but of course you may have your own ideas on visualization. You can also exploit this data set in your applications or parts of this data set. For example, you may have a, an application and you want to show how your, the services that you provide have evolved uh, thanks to uh, the changes in uh, the artificial intelligence evolution. Because uh, some years ago, some techniques were not feasible to be applied in real world applications. So, okay, this is my idea. Of course, you are free to find other ways to exploit our data set. But first, you should be able to access it. So, because of the uh, coronavirus uh, situation, we have not yet published the data set on the JRC data catalog and the open data portal, but this will be done soon. We know uh, the uh, link to the catalog that the data set will be published, but uh, for the time being, we make it available on the uh, GitHub repository of the AI Watch uh, project. Uh, the visualization that you uh, saw just before will be also available uh, online on the AI Watch Portal website. Uh, the AI Watch Portal is given here and I think that in a couple of weeks the visualization of the timeline will be there. Uh, we also plan to share the code for the visualization so that people will be able to uh, build on top of our work if they want to do so. So, as a conclusion, we did some work for you, let's say. We selected some uh, breakthroughs and we classified them using uh, the way to define artificial intelligence that our uh, test colleagues worked with. We have provided a first uh, visualization attempt and it will be available very soon on the AI Watch portal. And now you are free to use the dataset and exploit it in your applications uh, suggest you new visualizations and please uh, help us improve the data set with your feedback. So this is from my side. Uh, I'm happy to uh, listen to your questions if there are any. Okay. Hello. So uh, thank you very much all for your presentation. I think there are no questions. Uh, but if there's any further questions, please uh, don't hesitate to contact us to our functional uh, mailbox and we will be glad to uh, to answer to any questions you may have afterwards. So, well, this is then the end of the, um, of the webinar. As I'm saying before, uh, thank you all very much, all the speakers, to contribute uh, with your really, uh, uh, like, important like data sets for participants. I'm sure that it will be very useful. This uh, webinar will be soon published online and we will let you know what it is. Um, then the next webinar and the last one will be the webinar seven this Thursday and it will be by the Publications Office of the European Union. So we will have the EU Open Data Portal, we will have Euronext, we'll have TED, the Tenders Electronic Daily and we will have Seller, the semantic rep repository of the Publications Office of the European Union. So um, I hope you have a wonderful uh, evening. Uh, please submit your proposal for the 3rd of May. Uh, stay healthy and stay at home.